Good evening and welcome again to Free to Choose from the Barber Surgeons Hall here in the City of London. This is the third of six programmes exploring and criticising the economic theories and political ideas of the noted American economist and Nobel Prize winner, Professor Milton Friedman. And I have here with me in front of an invited audience of economists, bankers and others interested in Professor Friedman's ideas, a three-man panel, including Mr David Ennels, the former Secretary of State for Social Services in the Labour Cabinet, Sir Hector Lang, the Chairman of United Biscuits, and the Director of the Bank of England, and the former General Secretary of the Transport and General Workers' Union, Mr. Jack Jones. And later in the programme, they're going to have an opportunity to challenge Professor Friedman face to face, and in particular on two of his claims. First, that the Great Depression of the 1930s was not, as has been widely assumed, an example of a failure of capitalism, but was in fact an error of government. And secondly, that the massive increase in government expenditure since that time, particularly on social security, that's national insurance benefits and supplementary benefits and the other cash payments we make to people who are entitled or people who we believe to be in need, were bad not only for society, but were also damaging to the people who actually received the benefits. But first, as usual, we start with Professor Friedman's personal statement on film of his basic arguments, anatomy of a crisis. Delancey Street in New York's Lower East Side, hardly one of the city's best known sites. Yet what happened in this street nearly 50 years ago continues to affect all of us today. Wall Street. Most of us know what happened here 50 years ago. Inside the stock exchange, on October 29th, 1929, the market collapsed. It came to be known as Black Thursday. The Wall Street crash was followed by the worst depression in American history. That depression has been blamed on the failure of capitalism. It was no such thing, but the myth lives on. What really happened was very different. Although things looked healthy on the surface, business had begun to turn down in mid-1929. The crash intensified the recession. So did continuing bank failures in the South and Midwest. But the recession only became a crisis when these failures spread to New York. And in particular, to this building, then the headquarters of the Bank of United States. The failure of this bank had far-reaching effects, and it need never have happened. It was something of a historical accident that this particular bank played the role it did. Why did it fail? It was a perfectly good bank. Banks that were in far worse financial shape had come under difficulties before it did, and had, through the cooperation of other banks, been saved. The reason why it wasn't saved has to do with its rather special character. First, its name, Bank of United States, a name that made immigrants believe it was an official governmental bank, although in fact it was an ordinary commercial bank. Second, its ownership, Jewish. Both its name and the character of its ownership, which had so much to do with attracting a large number of depositors from the many Jewish businessmen in the city of New York. Both of them also had the effect of alienating other bankers who did not like the special advantage of the name and did not like the character of the ownership. As a result, other banks were all too ready to spread rumors, to help promote an atmosphere in which runs got started on the bank, in which it came into difficulty. And they were less than usually willing to cooperate in the efforts that were made to save it. Only a few blocks away, is the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. It was here that the Bank of the United States could have been saved. Indeed, the Federal Reserve System had been set up 17 years earlier, precisely to prevent the worst consequences of bank failures. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York, whose directors today meet in this room, devised a plan in cooperation with the superintendent of banking of the state of New York to save the Bank of the United States. Their plan called for merging the Bank of the United States with several other banks and also providing a guarantee fund to be subscribed to by still other bankers 
uh, to assure the depositors that the assets of the Bank of the United States were safe and sound. The Reserve Bank called meeting after meeting to try to put the plan into effect. It was on again, off again. But finally, after an all-night meeting on December 10th, 1930, the other bankers, including in particular John Pierpont Morgan, refused to subscribe to the guarantee fund, and the plan was off. The next day, the Bank of the United States closed its doors, never again to open for business. For its depositors, who saw their savings tied up and their businesses destroyed, the closing was tragic. Yet when the bank was finally liquidated, in the worst years of the Depression, it paid back 92 and a half cents on the dollar. Had the other banks cooperated to save it, no one would have lost a penny. For the other New York banks, they thought that closing the Bank of the United States would have purely local effects. They were wrong. Partly because it had so many depositors. Partly because so many of the depositors were small businessmen. Partly because it was the largest bank that had ever been permitted to fail in the United States up to this time. The effects were far-reaching. Depositors all over the country were frightened about the safety of their funds and rushed to withdraw them. There were runs, there were failures of banks by the droves. And all the time, the Federal Reserve System stood idly by when it had the power and the duty and the responsibility to provide the cash that would have enabled the banks to meet the insistent demands of their depositors without closing their doors. The way runs on banks can spread and can be stopped is a consequence of the way our banking system works. <laughs> you may think that when you take some cash to a bank and deposit it, the bank takes that money and sticks it in a vault somewhere to wait until you need it again to turn it back over to you. Okay, how would you like this? Like two tens, one five, and five ones. Okay. The bank does no such thing. It immediately takes a large part of what you put in and lends it out to somebody else. Thanks. How do you suppose it earns interest to pay its expenses or to pay you something for the use of your money? The result is that if all depositors at all the banks tried all at once to convert their deposits into cash, there wouldn't be anything like enough cash in the banks of the country to meet their demands. In order to prevent such an outcome, in order to cut short a run, it's necessary to have some way either to stop people from asking for it or to have some additional source from which cash can be obtained. That was intended to be the purpose of the Federal Reserve System. It was to provide the additional cash to meet the demands of depositors when a run arose. A classic example of how this system could and did work properly can be found over 2,000 miles from New York, near the Great Salt Lake in Utah. In the early 30s, some banks in Salt Lake City and surrounding towns began to get into difficulties. The owners of one of them were smart enough to see what had to be done to keep their banks open, and courageous enough to do it. When fearful depositors began to clamor to withdraw all their money, one of George Eccles' jobs was to brief his cashiers on how to handle the run. Well, then we called all our employees together, and we told them to be at the bank at their place at 8 o'clock and just act as if nothing was happening, just have a smile on their face, if they could, <laughs> and me too. <laughs> and uh, we had four savings windows, and we said, never leave the window. One shower, anything else, we must have every window open all day. But the important thing was we knew you'd have a big line there. So there's no use trying to hurry because the line was going to continue. So we said, now, when you uh, get a withdrawal slip and the passbook, go back and check the signature, even though you know your friend John Jones, just to delay time, just, just to mark time. And then when you pay the money out, we're not going to pay in $100 bills. We're going to pay in five, tens, and twenties. And count it twice and hand it out with a smile. The bank survived the morning, but they didn't have enough cash left. So in the afternoon, they called for more from the Federal Reserve Bank. 
So the Federal Reserve sent up the armored car, two big sacks full of uh, currency was brought in by the guard, crowded through the crowd. And the assistant manager, Morgan Kraft, came in also. So Mariner, my brother, uh, grabbed Mr. Kraft and he said, now get up on this marble counter and tell these people that, that you've brought up a lot of money and there's more where that came from. And he did. And then Mariner got up and said, now you've heard that story, we're not going to close. We're going to stay open as long as any of you people want your money. So don't worry about it at all. Well, of course, he had one other bank in the city, and we called him and told him that he couldn't close either. He said, well, I can't. I haven't any money to stay open. So we made him a temporary loan because we had another bank closed while this run was going on. The psychology of the public could be such they'd... We'd never break the run in our bank. Everybody would come until they got all, all of their money out. The bank survived the first day's run. It was time to change psychology. The second day was to be very different. So that evening, we called our employees all together because we knew that the next day, uh, people had been working during the day and would have heard about this, and the next morning, we'd have them with us. So we figured, now, we can't let a crowd uh, build up in the lobby. So we told our tellers, our, I says, now, uh, you pay out this money just as fast as you can. So when anybody comes in the front door, they don't see a line. You pay out $100 bills. And don't let any line ever develop at your window. Well, it never did. So along about noontime, people were just coming and going in a normal fashion, and the run was, the run was over. It was all a question of reassuring the public that they could get their money. The Federal Reserve System was there to ensure that this happened by supplying cash to the banks. Why didn't the system prevent the Great Depression after 1929? Because from 1929 to 1930, after the stock market crash, the Federal Reserve System allowed the quantity of money to decline slowly, thereby throttling the monetary structure. By December 1930, the quantity of money had fallen by 3%, which may not seem much, but a growing economy needs additional money in order to prevent deflation and problems. Given this throttling of the monetary system, what happened after that was more or less inevitable. If the Bank of the United States had not happened to fail, some other bank would have been the victim. It would have failed and would have set off the runs. Once the runs started, the Federal Reserve could have prevented them from having the disastrous consequences they did by stepping in and providing the banking system in general through creating new money with the cash it needed to meet the demands of depositors. After all, once depositors start trying to take their money out of the banks, there is a strong tendency for the quantity of money to fall. Each dollar of cash which is withdrawn from a bank had been backing several dollars of deposits. If the Federal Reserve had stepped in, bought government securities on a large scale, provided the cash, the depositors would have found that they could get their money and they would have stopped asking for it. As bank after bank closed, a chain reaction was in process, destroying money as it went. It's a process that even today, few bankers understand. If you ask an individual banker whether he creates money, he'll look at you as if you're mad. Of course not, he'll say, I don't create money, all I do is I accept deposits from my customers, I put a little of that deposit in the vault as a reserve, and I lend the rest out. I don't create money. From the point of view of the economist, the situation is very different. As I've explained earlier, most of the deposits on the books of banks were put there by an accountant's pen. But that simple fact is concealed from the individual banker because it doesn't happen here inside the bank. It happens as a result of the transactions between banks. As the men who ran the Federal Reserve knew very well, it happens when money loaned by one bank is deposited in another bank to be loaned out yet again. In the Depression, the process was working in reverse. The banks were destroying money. Nonetheless, the Federal Reserve let it happen. The end result was that by the time the whole sorry episode was over, by 1933, the quantity of money in the United States had gone down by a third. The slow throttling had turned into strangulation. 
For every $3 of currency and deposits that people had had in 1929, only $2 were left. For every three banks that were open in 1929, in 1933, only two were left. The terrible depression that followed was a direct result of bungling by the Federal Reserve System. Their monetary policy stifled any hope of economic recovery. Worse still, America's depression was to become worldwide because of what lies behind these doors. This is the vault of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Inside is the largest hoard of gold in the world. Because the world was on a gold standard in 1929, these vaults where the U.S. gold was stored provide an excellent test of where the Depression originated. If the Depression had started in Europe or somewhere else in the world, the U.S. would have lost gold. More gold would have flown out of the country than came in. If, on the other hand, the Depression started in the United States, well, then the opposite would happen. More gold would come in from abroad as the effects of our depression spread there, then went out abroad. In reality, that is exactly what happened. When the international money system was based on gold, the rules of the game were these. The gold in the United States was supposed to control the amount of money issued by the Federal Reserve. In turn, the amount the Federal Reserve issued controlled the amount of money issued by the commercial banks, which in turn controlled the amount of money that individuals, businesses and industry could get from the banks. The result, a monetary structure, all supposedly tied to the amount of gold in the vaults in the United States. But in 1930, the Federal Reserve didn't play by the rules. It stood by as banks started to collapse, and with each one that went, the money supply fell. Businesses and industry inevitably began to fail. Americans, now poorer, bought less from abroad. Britain was one of the countries affected. Like the United States, Britain had its own monetary structure tied to gold. The trouble was that Britain could now sell less abroad. It cut down the amount it bought from abroad, but not by enough. Under the rules of the gold standard, it had to pay the difference in gold. With every bar of gold that was shipped out of Britain, the amount of money decreased. A depression that was already underway in Britain got worse. British gold flowed into the United States, supposedly to form the foundation of a new slice of the monetary structure. But the Federal Reserve didn't let it. The gold was simply locked away. The results? Britain remained in trouble until in 1931 it went off the gold standard, cutting the link between the amount of gold and the amount of money. In the United States, suffering the worst depression in history, there was plenty of gold, but to no avail. Although these events happened almost 50 years ago, many of our policies today derive directly from them. Central bankers throughout the world, government officials everywhere, are afraid of a new Great Depression. They have therefore moved in the opposite direction. Instead of the problem of too little money, we are faced with the problem of too much money. The problems of inflation that plague us today trace directly from the problem of deflation that plagued us from 1929 to 1933. People came to believe that free market capitalism had failed. Something was needed to replace it. At Cambridge University in England, a new orthodoxy emerged in the 30s, one that has remained powerful to this day. It owes its influence to the brilliance of one man. John Maynard Keynes was unquestionably one of the greatest economists of all time. Like other economists of his generation, he found the Great Depression both a paradox and a challenge. It was a paradox because it seemed to contradict some of the fundamental principles that economists had come to take for granted. Keynes rose to the challenge by constructing a complex and sophisticated hypothesis 
which not only explained what had been going on, but also offered a way out, a way to end the Great Depression and to avoid similar episodes in the future. The core of his theory was that what happened to the quantity of money didn't matter. What really mattered was a particular category of spending, in economists' jargon, autonomous spending. What kind of spending is that? It might be investment by business enterprises in building factories and adding to the number of machines and adding to inventories. It might be spending by individuals to build houses. Or, most important of all, it might be deficit spending by government. If private spending on investment, on house building, was not enough to maintain full employment, then government could always step in and spend enough to make up the difference. The theory of pump priming was born. The theory was a godsend to politicians that had been, who had been grasping at any expedient. After all, throughout the ages, politicians have been only too willing to spend money, provided they didn't have to tax their citizens to pay for it. And here along came a scientific theory offered under the most responsible of auspices that justified what they had been wanting to do all along. Is it any wonder that government spending has exploded ever since? Or that deficit spending, even without the excuse of war, and on a large scale, has become the order of the day? The idea that government had to protect us came to be accepted during the terrible years of the Depression. Capitalism was said to have failed, and politicians were looking for a new approach. Roosevelt's first priority after his election was to deal with massive unemployment. A public works program was started. The government financed projects to build highways, bridges, and dams. The National Recovery Administration was set up to revitalize industry. Roosevelt wanted to see America move into a new era. The Social Security Act was passed and other measures followed. Unemployment benefits, welfare payments, distribution of surplus food. With these measures, of course, came rules, regulations, and red tape, as familiar today as they were novel then. The government bureaucracy began to grow and it's been growing ever since. This is just a small part of the Social Security Empire today. Their headquarters in Baltimore has 16 rooms this size. All these people are dispensing our money with the best possible intentions. But at what cost? In the 50 years since the Albany meetings, we have given government more and more control over our lives and our income. In New York State alone, these government buildings house 11,000 bureaucrats, administering government programs that cost New York taxpayers $22 billion. At the federal level, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare alone has a budget larger than any government in the world, except only Russia and the United States. Yet these government measures often do not help the people they are supposed to. All right. Richard Brown's daughter, Halima, needs oh, constant Brown. medical attention. She has a throat defect and has to be connected to a breathing machine so that she'll survive the nights. It's expensive treatment, and you might expect the family to qualify for a Medicaid grant. No, I don't get it, because I'm not eligible for it. I make a few dollars too much. And the salary that I make, I, I can't afford to really live and save anything. It's out of the question. And I mean, I live, we live from payday to payday. I mean, literally from payday to payday. The struggle isn't made any easier by the fact that Mr. Brown knows that if he gave up his job as an orderly at the Harlem Hospital, he would qualify for a government handout. And he'd be better off financially. Um, Mr. Brown, can we say the There's a section patient. It's a terrible pressure on him. But he's proud of the work that he does here, and he's strong enough to resist the pressure. Mr. Brown, uh, and you're fully dilated, so I'm here to take you to the delivery room. 
Try not to push, please, because you want to have a nice, sterile delivery. Okay. Mr. Brown has found out the hard way okay? that welfare okay. programs Don't destroy an individual's independence. In we have considered welfare. Uh, we went to see about apply for welfare, but we were told that we were only eligible for five dollars a month, and uh, and. To, to receive this five dollars, we would have to uh, cash in our son's savings bonds, and that, that's not even worth it. But I don't believe in something for nothing anyway. I think a lot of people are capable of working and are willing to work, but it's, it's just the way it's set up. It, um, the, the mother and the children are better off if the husband isn't working or if the husband isn't there. And this breaks up so many poor families. Yeah. One of the saddest things is that many of the children whose parents are on welfare will, in their turn, end up in the welfare trap when they grow up. In this public housing project in the Bronx, New York, three quarters of the families are now receiving welfare payments. Well, Mr. Brown wanted to keep away from this kind of thing for a very good reason. The people who get on welfare lose their human independence and feeling of dignity. They become subject to the dictates and whims of their welfare supervisor who can tell them whether they can live here or there, whether they may put in a telephone, what they may do with their lives. They're treated like children, not like responsible adults. And they're trapped in the system. Maybe a job comes up that looks better than welfare, but they're afraid to take it because if they lose it after a few months, it may be six months or nine months before they can get back onto welfare. And as a result, this becomes a self-perpetuating cycle, rather than simply a temporary state of affairs. Things have gone even further elsewhere. This is a Hume Estate, a public housing project in Manchester, England. Well, we're 3,000 miles away from the Bronx here, but you'd never know it just by looking around. It looks as if we're at the same place. It's the same kind of flats, same kind of massive housing units, decrepit even though they were only built seven or eight years ago, vandalism, graffiti, the same feeling about the place of people who don't have a great deal of drive and energy because somebody else is taking care of their day-to-day -day needs because the state has deprived them of an incentive to find jobs to become responsible people to be the real supports of themselves and their families. For the past seven years, Maureen Ramsey has had to buy food and clothes for her family out of a government handout. For the whole of that time, her husband, Steve, hasn't had a job. Each week, he collects what's known in Britain as Social Security. The government looks after him, his wife, and their children. <coughs> but accepting welfare payments means accepting the rules of those who hand them out. My opinion, anyway, you feel as they own you. You know, there's no other way of putting it. Say, I got a job tomorrow because I needed something. Well, I know that I've got to go down there and report it. Because I couldn't go into the job because you'd be looking over your shoulder thinking, oh, the Social Security's coming in. I'm going to be done for it. It's, ju it's just hopeless. You can't fight against it. The jobs around now these days, you only come up with about £45 a week. And then you need a doctor stamp out of that. You still finish up with about £39. So what good is he working? I mean, you still get the same thing, you know what I mean? I can't see any sense of it. Of course, he's quite right that it may not pay him uh, to get a job now. That's not his fault, and I don't blame him. He's acting sensibly and intelligently for his own interest and the interest of his family. It's the fault of a system which takes away the incentive from him to get a job. But suppose you were cruel and simply took away the welfare overnight, cut it off. What would happen? He would find a job. What kind of a job? I don't know. It would, might not be a very nice job. It might not be a very attractive job. But at some wage, at some level of pay, there will always be a job which he could get for himself. It might be also that he would be driven to rely on some private charity. He might have to get soup kitchen help or the equivalent. Again, I'm not saying that's desirable or nice or a good thing. It isn't. But as a matter of actual fact as to what would happen, there is little doubt that he would find some way to earn a living. The American government is trying to break the welfare trap. These people were unemployed. 
They're now being trained at the taxpayer's expense. It may or may not lead to a real job. Here we have a vast national welfare system, which is diametrically opposed to everything that America believes in. Because America was founded on a work ethic, uh, has practiced the work ethic, and has said this is what we want everybody to do, the opportunity to hold a job in, in America. Everyone here has to clock in and do a full day's work. It's an attempt to make it seem like a real job. We're saying a job is a part of the American way of life, and we're going to help you find a job so that you can get a piece of the pie, you can pay taxes, you can become a, uh, a part of that American dream. But the dream isn't working. Schemes like this, run under the government's Comprehensive Education and Training Act, CETA, have a high dropout rate, and many trainees end up back where they began, on welfare. The men and women who administer CETA and similar programs, the officials of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, are dedicated people. Their motives are good. Their achievements are not. The results of these programs have been disappointing. Why? I believe that the basic reason is, is because it is very hard to achieve good objectives through bad means. And the means we have been using are bad in two very different respects. In the first place, all of these programs involve some people spending other people's money for objectives that are determined by still a third group of people. Nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own. Nobody has the same dedication to achieving somebody else's objectives that he displays when he pursues his own. Beyond this, the programs have a insidious effect on the moral fiber of both the people who administer the programs and the people who are supposedly benefiting from it. For the people who administer it, it instills in them a feeling of almost godlike power. For the people who are supposedly benefiting, it instills a feeling of childlike dependence. Their capacity for personal decision-making atrophies. The result is that the programs involve a misuse of money. They do not achieve the objectives which it was their intention to achieve. But far more important than this, they tend to rot, rot away the very fabric that holds a decent society together. The figure of if you think that's overstating the case, look what HEW found when it made a special investigation into the spending of the vast funds it administers. We just uh, got the plan from the Public Health Service on reducing the necessary beds. In these reels of tape that record every payment made, every recipient, they found evidence that a staggering seven and a half billion dollars had been lost by fraud, waste, and abuse in one year. Doctors, building contractors, hospitals, schools, welfare recipients, everyone had been fraudulently dipping into the pot. And the investigation isn't over yet. The inevitable consequence of having a huge pot of taxpayers' money is that all of us want to get our hands in it. You can be sure that we'll all be able to find very good reasons why we should be the ones to spend somebody else's money. Somebody or other put up a good case for spending taxpayers' money to subsidize rents in New York City, including the rents of these apartments. The people who occupy these apartments pay something like $200 a month less than the market rent. And that subsidy comes out of the taxes of people, most of whom are much poorer than the people who live here. It's not unusual for this sort of thing to happen when government tries to do good with our money. Look at what happened in Chicago. For most visitors, the immediate impression is of a rich, prosperous, bustling city.
But like every large city in America, it has its problem areas. Overcrowded slums breeding poverty and crime. After World War II, one such area developed in Hyde Park. In the 50s, plans were drawn up to pull down large areas of slum building and to rebuild using government funds under an urban renewal program. It was to be a show project, replacing a blighted area with an integrated community. Who controlled the spending of that government money? It was, in fact, my own University of Chicago which felt its very existence threatened by the spread of urban blight and crime. Government money was used to tear down an area that contained many small shops as well as families of low income. Once the area was cleared, private money rebuilt it with middle-class apartments, townhouses, and shopping complexes. The blight had been cleared here, but only to be shifted elsewhere. In many instances, when, when government administers large grants, a lot of those funds don't wind up directly uh, serving the people and achieving the objectives that, that were the intent of the programs because you, the, the, the grant has to feed that large government bureaucracy. Joe Gardner helped to set up an organization of local black people to protect their own interests. Previously, the blacks had rioted in the streets to try to get their way. Now it was to be done peacefully using government money. When government funds became available, the Woodlawn organization got control. They used them to build the kind of houses they wanted, low-rise apartments like these. The bureaucrats, planners, and architects told them that it was uneconomical, that only high-rise blocks would work. They were wrong. A lot of people have this, this view that uh, the disadvantaged, if you will, have no idea of what their problems are and how to resolve them, that it takes outside professionals to do that. And we say that's baloney because the outside professional does not feel in his gut what a uh, woman on welfare with six kids uh, living off $100 a month in a, in a, in a uh, deteriorated building feels. She can come up with solutions much better than a bureaucrat. The intentions of this local community group are good. They want to rebuild the community as the community wants. I said, are you pretty pleased with the work we're doing? Yes, I am. Very pleased with it. But government money always corrupts. Look at the number of people rebuilding this garage. It doesn't make sense, except that these are CETA workers paid for by taxpayers' money. Government funds have allowed the organization to take over a whole area of Chicago. They now have their own supermarket. They've built splendid houses for middle-class occupiers, very expensive, protected by the latest security systems, all at the taxpayer's expense. In a sense, TWO is rapidly becoming a mini-government. At this particular point, we have approximately 400 employees. Uh, we have an operating budget of uh, in excess of $5 million a year. So we are large. Large and expanding. Their next project is to redevelop this site. And that's only the first step in a 20-year plan that will cost $220 million, most of it coming from the taxpayer. In the South Bronx, they're very familiar with government protection, like the rent controls that made it uneconomic for landlords to maintain their buildings. They've moved out and the vandals have moved in. The South Bronx is an area where many of the people are on welfare and where the crime rate is high. But all this could change. A group of local people has begun to renovate these buildings to build new homes. They call themselves sweat equity because at first sweat and effort was all they could put into the project. Only later did they accept a small government grant. How long ago did you start working on this building? Four months ago. On this building, right here. And I take it what you're going to do is gut the whole thing from beginning to end. Right, totally gut it. And you'll have to rewire, wire, put new walls up, new floors, new ceilings, new everything. Worked in the winter, worked in the summer, yeah. worked when I had a chance to work. How many people have you got working here? A good 40 people. How do you keep them working? 
<laughs> you know, some of them must want to get tired of, of course, it and pull of off and so on. So well, how do you... It's like even interested. We, we show them what could be done in the future, what will be done in the future. Mm -hmm. And they get, they get, well, at first, it's kind of hard to prove to somebody that in the next three, four years, what will come out of it. They can't see it in the long range term. Mm -hmm. They want to see it in the short run. They need sure. money right now, not in two and three years. Sure. So we, we try to show them that it will happen. It's true they now accept some government money. But so far, they've managed to retain their original philosophy that the best way to get something done well is to do it yourself. Okay, like what we're doing, we're bringing people out of the street, giving them something to look forward to. They have their own apartment. They'll be taking care of the area around it. They have a garden. They have something to look forward to. They can even get off welfare. We can even get them a job. So they can drop the welfare and have some self-pride. That's the whole thing about it, it's self-pride. Because as long as you collect it from the government and sitting back, you got no worries. We're not sitting back, we're working. We're, we're making that money come in. And we're putting it into our building. We're, we're building ourselves up as well as the building. Some of these people are CETA workers, paid for by the taxpayer. But this isn't as useful as it might appear. You ask these fellows, which would they rather have, the CETA workers or the money that's being paid to the CETA workers? <laughs> which would you rather have? The money paid to the, the CETA workers. That's your answer? But that's very expensive help. In terms it's of what these people could use with the money, you give these people the amount of money you're paying to that CETA workers, and I'll bet they'll have twice as much, three times as much work. Yeah. Out of it. Am I wrong? You're right. You're right. Exactly. So that's a very inefficient way to use that money. The problem is you've got a bureaucracy and the government right. bureaucrats, they want to decide what to do. They don't want to let you decide what exactly. to do. Ask yourself, how did this place get built up in the first place? After all, this was a pretty respectable, solid, substantial region when it was first developed. It wasn't done through a government project. It was done by people individually having an incentive to put up these buildings and occupy them. What these people we've been seeing here are doing is they're trying to restore that feeling and that attitude. You'll have a far healthier community here if it grows out of the self-help of people like the people we've been talking to than if it's a paternalistic venture undertaken by governmental civil servants and bureaucrats who have to plan on a large scale for other people. We have become increasingly dependent on government we have surrendered power to government. Nobody has taken it from us. It's our doing. The results? Monumental government spending. Much of it wasted. Little of it. Going to the people whom we would like to see helped. Burdensome taxes. High inflation. A welfare system under which neither those who receive help nor those who pay for it are satisfied. Trying to do good with other people's money simply has not worked. A welfare state system simply has not worked. Well, whether all that makes you want to pop a champagne cork or hurl a beer bottle at the screen, you'll agree that there's a great deal to argue about. Have so many people really been wrong for so long in assuming that the Great Depression of the 1930s was the classic demonstration that uh, unaided free market capitalism could not be relied upon to guarantee prosperity and full employment and that therefore the government must accept much wider responsibilities for managing the economy? Have we been making a tragic mistake all these years in providing social security, national insurance and supplementary benefits for people who we believed were entitled uh, and were in need? Well, we'll examine those two questions and in that order. And in a moment, I want to bring in our panel of Jack Jones, David Ennels, and Sir Hector Lang. But first, Professor Freeman, may I press you a little further on your explanation of the causes of the Great Depression? As I understand your account, it essentially is some private commercial banks failed, the Federal Reserve took no action, that those failures spread to other banks, and this in due course spread right throughout the private economy of industry and consumers so that economic activity was strangled, unemployment rose, and that the Federal Reserve failed and culpably failed to take action during that period. Now, even supposing that's all right, and even supposing that the monetary theory underlying it is correct, is it in accordance with normal common sense to say that because somebody fails to prevent something which they maybe could have prevented, that therefore they caused it, they caused it and that this was not truly a spontaneous failure of the private enterprise system? It is for the following reason. 
uh, we had a similar experience before the Federal Reserve System was set up. In 1907, we had a similar chain of events get started. But because there was no Federal Reserve System, it was brought to an end by the concerted voluntary action of banks who suspended for a brief time the conversion of deposits into cash and in this way stopped the cash drain. If there had been no Federal Reserve System in existence in 1930 and 31, it is my considered opinion that the Depression would have been over by 1931 at the latest. In the same way, once a series of runs seemed to be starting, you would have had a concerted, as it was called, restriction of payments by the banks, which would have given you time for the panic to be overcome. In 1907, that happened early in 1908, the whole episode lasted less than a year. Within a year, you were back on an up track. It was that episode that led to setting up the Federal Reserve. The purpose for setting up the Federal Reserve in the light of that episode was precisely that it would provide a source of liquidity when banks were subject to run. Moreover, there's one more thing that I think is very important. It isn't that there was ignorance at the time. The people who ran the Federal Reserve Bank of New York knew all along what should be done. They were pleading with the Federal Reserve Board in Washington to allow them to buy on the open market and to provide the reserves that the bank needed. It was a consequence of a failure of the system to do what it was set up to do, and that in turn derived from a power struggle between the bank in New York and the Federal Reserve Board in Washington. Well, wasn't the fact that the system which is a government-created body created by the Congress, was set up precisely in order to prevent a Great Depression, wasn't that itself a recognition that even in an archetypally capitalist system, government ultimately has the responsibility for seeing that this kind of thing does not happen, whether by monetary action or by budgetary action or in any other way? There's no question, in my opinion, that government has a responsibility for providing a stable money. And it's that responsibility that f government and, and failed to act. And full employment? No. No, government has a responsibility for providing a stable money. So if, government government provides, if government provides a stable money, if the private market is permitted to operate, you will have, uh, full employment is a very difficult term to define, you will have a high level of employment, and you will have a high level of prosperity. Let, let me now bring in Jack Jones, the former General Secretary of the really? TNGW, because you lived through the 1930s. Your of socialist course. face and was one, created one during that time. I lived, I you... lived through the 1930s, okay. too. Well, that's right. But let's, let's right. hear his... We're roughly... Receiving, and you were at the his... university, probably. No, let's hear no, his socialist no, analysis I, of the I was, causes I was, of the Great Depression. I was We've working in a factory, and, and the factory went bankrupt under the great system that you're defending. It seems to me that you... You're ignoring the fact that there was indeed a depression before the crash in Wall Street, yeah. certainly in Britain, it was in Britain. and, and uh, to a degree in, in, in America. Uh, indeed, in America, the conditions of working people were pretty bad. A, a lot of them lived on a, a debt system. They were head and heels in, uh, up to the heads in debt. They, they bought the houses on the debt system. They were in debt to the company's store. They lived and died in debt, and to some extent that's still the case, but that's by the way. The fact is that it was a failure of, if you like, finance capitalism to support industrial capitalism. It was the manipulation of, of money, of buying, lending, spending. Uh, that was the basic cause, I suggest to you. Let's go back to the British case in the 1920s. And, and, well, the British what caused case, it the in fact Britain? was that we nearly had two million unemployed when you had the Wall, Wall Street Why? crash. Why? Because well, Britain, again, it was a monetary mistake. It was because Britain went back on gold at the well, pre-war parity in 1925. I don't disagree that, that the going back on gold wasn't a partial, partial cause of it, but that was basically capitalism. And the fact is we were in the, in well, the world... Well, of course, if you're going to we call everything the, capitalism... Excuse me, we were in the world competitive system. When Britain went on gold and, and, and Germany started to export coal, you know, under that period when they were allowed to do, yes. uh, our coal miners were were put out of work, the wages were cut, uh, and that was part of the general process. If Britain had uh, not I, I remember uh, A.P. Herbert said, steel's gone to glory, cotton's in the shade, but we've still got the money lending trade. And that was Britain and America, <laughs> I suggest to you, basically. You have the money lending trade all the time, but let's get the facts straight. The 1920s in the United States was a period in which the average income... It was a free was market economy. It was a free market economy, and it was a period in which the, the average... income went to the wall. You are wrong. It was a period in which the average income of the ordinary working man 
went up very sharply from after the immediately after the war in 1921 to telling me there wasn't bad housing and bad living conditions there's always and bad low wages there's always bad housing and it was there's cheap continental labor that helped you go there was no cheap continental oh, labor that helped there certainly was read the jungle <laughs> excuse me i've read the jungle which happens to have been uh, written about the period before 19 Ten. Okay, there was, it was, uh, it was a much earlier those period. Those factors were still there in the 20s. But look, we have to look at where we start from and where we go. The course was upward. The average income of the worker was going up very sharply. Those were, why did people from all over the world want to come to, the Amer to America? Working people, ordinary because, people. Because, US because conditions were economy. better. It's a big but, economy. But you, the, you had jobs, and this is where I think you're making Of course we had big, jobs. I think where you're making a very big mistake. The U.S. is certainly not. United Kingdom, and certainly not Europe, no, in terms not. of the size of the economy, the jobs you had to offer. But I say that even then, those jobs, many of them were, were low paid, uh, and the free market prevailed, and the free market killed you in the Wall Street cash. On the, quite, to the, quite to the contrary, it wasn't the free market that killed us. It was the mismanagement of the monetary system, as in Britain. So it you, was want, a mismanagement you wanted of governmental the support system. for capitalism. I do not want government support for capitalism. I want a free market. I am not. So you don't want a managed economy? I do not want a managed economy because the people who so manage do, it invariably manage it Why do you, want, federal, manage why do you want a federal reserve? I don't. I have always I been in favor. I thought you were arguing that that was the cause of it. Excuse like me, it was. But I have always argued that the right solution would have been to abolish the Federal Reserve and eliminate it. I'm not a defender of the Federal Reserve. Very far so from it. So you want you want total Look, let free me, for all. Let me go back. No, but let me go back to this whole. Episode. Can I just come back to tell you what happened in Britain? You know, after the Wall Street crash. Yes, I know what we happened. Had, we had we had the May Committee. Do you remember that? Yes. And they adopted the very things that you've been recommended now. The idea. Well, you recommend. I'm not talking of this discussion, but you're generally recommending. A very substantial cut in unemployment benefit, substantial cuts in total government expenditure, <coughs> cuts in, 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 in the public services generally, so that it meant that the buying power of people even on low, uh, low, low incomes was substantially cut, and we had bankruptcies from John O'Groats to Land's End. But let me take your experience in And Britain. we had a mutiny, incidentally, in the Navy. But let me take your experience... Don't, don't forget that. But let me take your experience in Britain, because it's an ideal demonstration of the point I'm making in the film. In 1931, in September 1931, Britain went off the gold standard. That's right. From that point on, Britain recovered. The Depression came to an end in Britain in 1931. In the United States... Oh, come off it. The, the Depression. We had three million... On, no, please, of the facts. I don't mean, of course. In terms of unemployment, unemployment went up. We had three million unemployed. I was marching in a hunger march in the early 30s. I know what the circumstances were. When I say were, the depression came to an end, we, I mean the downward decline came to an end and you start, you, you were lost. We started, you frankly, still had with the armament in, 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 in 36, you, 37. I'm going to bring in Sir Hector Lang at this point because he is a businessman, a very distinguished industrialist, and I want to ask him, going back to our theme of the causes of the Great Depression of the 1930s and whether or not this was a failure of unaided capitalism, would you, as a businessman, be happy about the future and security and profitability of your business to rely, as Professor Friedman would, on unaided market forces with uh, no Federal Reserve System, with no government responsibility for maintaining high employment and prosperity? No, I certainly would not. But to come back to what I consider to be the central theme, which is the control of the money supply, it is important to, to, to keep it right, obviously, but it is unlikely to be the sole answer, certainly not in this day and age now, and it's the lessons that we're trying to learn. Monetarism uh, in this country has become a very em emotive word. It's not understood, but so long as we are going to keep down inflation, or to try and keep it down, control of the money supply is absolutely vital. And we have to learn the lesson that it, w it was allowed to decline too much in the 30s, it has uh, been allowed to rise too much in the 70s, and so we've got to keep a balance. But that balance can only be practically done uh, if we don't allow too many shock waves to go out into the economy to create some of the conditions that were happened in the 30s and the 70s. I agree completely. I am very much disturbed by the kind of uh, connotations that have been attached to the word monetarism. Monetarism is not a be-all and end-all for everything. Control of the quantity of money is a necessary and sufficient condition to control inflation. It is only a necessary condition. 
for the solution of the other major problems that bother our country. Really From that point of view, you have other we're things we're that are far more important. We're in danger at this point of beginning to trespass onto what sure. will be a subject of a later program when we shall have the inestimable benefit of having the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sir Geoffrey Howe, and the former Chancellor, Mr. Dennis Healy, to pursue it. And I would like now to move our discussion on to the very provocative things that you say about social security in the uh, film. First of all, I think we ought to define our terms a little carefully. You very naturally in the film use American terminology and in American terminology social security means contributions, means benefits that people get it, it, in respect of the fact that they have paid contributions to social security tax. When you talk about welfare you mean cash benefits paid to people who have not paid a contribution but because they're in need. In Britain we call the first national insurance and we call the second supplementary benefits broadly speaking. So we need that little bit of translation. Now, I would like to be clear, because I wasn't clear from the film, are you saying, Professor Friedman, that in a healthy society or an ideal society, there would be no supplementary benefit stroke welfare system, there would be no social security stroke national insurance system, there would be no system of cash benefits, uh, either insured or uninsured, uh, organized by the government at all? No, I'm saying uh, something very different, which comes out in another one of these programs, which is that uh, I am in favor of preventing acute distress. I think no society, I don't think there's any difference between Jack Jones and myself, for example, or between uh, David Annals and uh, Hector Lang and myself on the objectives. It is intolerable that you should allow people to starve in a society in which starvation is not physically necessary. The question is, what are the means that are best suited to achieve that objective? And my answer would be to substitute for the whole present system of both old age benefits and uh, what do you call it? Unemployment benefits, un sickness benefits, disenrollment benefits. A single system of a negative income tax, which you call in this country a reverse income tax, which would help people who are in need because they are in need. Now let me add one more thing. We have at this point made commitments to people. We should live up to those commitments. I am not proposing at all that we should in any retroactive way eliminate commitments we have made to people. People who have paid into the social insurance scheme quite rightly feel that they are entitled to receive the benefits that they were promised. And so the proposals I have made in much more detail for the United States, because I don't know the British situation, I would not pretend to make detailed proposals for Britain. I, I but think the proposals I have made in the United States would involve living up to all present commitments, but gradually tapering off. I think perhaps for the benefit of our viewers, we ought to just clarify what the phrase a negative income tax might uh, mean, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong. It's a system under which just as many people pay tax to the government because their income rises above a certain level, they would, as it were, receive payments from the government because their income falls below That's a right. certain level. So it would work like income tax in reverse, it would be related to their income, and therefore would be a form of social security if you wanted to Absolutely. give it that name. Absolutely. Well, now let me bring in David Ennels, the former Secretary of State for the Social <coughs> Services, including social security. Is there anything in Professor Friedman's approach with which you agree? <laughs> Hardly anything, I have to say. I mean, I think that uh, so much of the film was totally irrelevant to, uh, to British society, and I'm extremely sad that uh, Professor Friedman draws conclusions about uh, what might be done in Britain uh, on the basis of his own interpretation, and I, I disagree with much of his interpretation, about what happened in the United States. I, I'm not going to get uh, into the argument about the Depression, but I did happen myself also to be in the United States at the end of the 1930s, and I saw some of the magnificent things that were done uh, by, uh, by President Roosevelt in uh, job creation, in doing things that enabled people to have some pride for themselves. But what uh, upset me all the time about the, uh, the, the presentation of, Pres uh, of uh, Professor Friedman was that he was talking about other people's money. Uh, we're not. We're talking about our money. We're talking about money that has been contributed by British people themselves to be used for certain purposes. Now, the vast proportion of what you call a handouts is, in fact, going to nearly 10 million pensioners. Uh, and, and the thought that it is taking away their independence, it is providing them with independence so that they can... You talk about starvation as if somehow or other that's the, that's the only thing we should be really worried about. If a man's actually going to starve, then we worry about him. I think people should be allowed to live in dignity, uh, whether they are elderly people, uh, whether they are sick people, disabled people, unemployed people. All these people are, are part of the state's responsibility to help them 
to help them to help themselves and the to help them to excuse, live in their own independence. Excuse me, the state has no responsibility. People have responsibility. Responsibility is a human thing. You say live in dignity. Were those the Ramses we showed in that picture living in dignity? Very, very far from it. You say our money? Your whole approach is a collectivist approach. Our no, does not no, mean no. the money of the people uh, no. of, uh, of Britain. It this means is, that what happens is that A votes to impose taxes on B, supposedly to help C. And the end result is that a lot of the money gets back into the pockets this of A and B say, before it gets this to This is C. why I said, Professor Friedman, that uh, so much of your film may be relevant in the United States, and I may know, uh, know less about it. It isn't very relevant in Britain. Look at the case of, I noted, Richard Brown's daughter and whether it was going to be possible uh, for her to have her operation. And he said, in no way I haven't got the money. In Britain, because of the National Health Service, paid for by all the people, no one would question for a moment whether that operation should Except be carried out. Now, isn't, isn't that right? No, sure you no it is not right. right. You have well, 700,000 put... 700, people on a waiting list. Waiting sometimes one, two, three years to get an operation. Well, not, on the not, contrary, not for emergency cases. I mean, we must, we have to accept. The definition of emergency we, is kind of flexible at well, times. Well, we have to. <laughs> so the subject of another sure, program. I want to bring in, if I may, Sir, Sir Hector Lang here and ask him a question which particularly arises out of the film no, that we saw when we, when we saw the um, gentleman, of whom Professor Friedman said that if he was not getting unemployment benefit he would be able to go out and find a job. He said it might not be a very nice one, but Stephen he was Ramsey. confident that he would be able to go out and find a job. Now, you're an employer, a very large employer, Sir Hector. Is it your belief that unemployment benefit stands in the way of large numbers of people being employed who could be usefully employed in industry if they were not, as it were, uh, seduced by unemployment benefit out of the uh, labour force? It's too wide a question to answer on this because in certain parts of the country I think that is possible, in other parts it's certainly not possible. And I don't go down all the way with uh, what the professor has been saying. I do believe in a compassionate society, but we've got the balance wrong. I've talked about balance already once tonight. We've got the balance wrong here, and for two very good reasons. The first is that we are spending wealth that we haven't got, and too much uh, is going into what I might loosely call a compassionate society and too little into investment, so we're not creating enough wealth to do what we want to do. That's one side. The other side is that the welfare system, such as we have, creates too much power at the center. Centralization and bureaucracy is very expensive and self-defeating in the end. I, I quite opinion. agree with that. I, I quite agree with that. David, 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 David. I'd, like to, I'd, like to, I'd like to add my penny worth uh, to, to this. <laughs> in part of the film, at one stage, you said, now let's, uh, let's suppose that we scrapped unemployment benefits. Uh, and then you went on to argue that uh, most people somehow or other would find jobs. Well, let, let's say I, I agree that some people would. I think there is a small element in British society who, uh, who could find jobs if they, if they really wanted to. I don't question that. There would be a lot of people, and the government statistics suggest that uh, uh, this uh, 1979, 1,370,000 unemployed, they pick this year it'll be 1,790,000, 1981 it'll be 2 million, uh, and 1982 we go on, we go on. Uh, uh, you, you really can't argue to me uh, that somehow or other, you, in fact you did argue, you said yes. They'll, they'll I can't be argue go, it, I may be wrong, but I can <laughs> argue it. <laughs> you, you, your argument was that they would, uh, of course if they didn't get jobs, they'd go to soup kitchens and they'd rely upon uh, voluntary uh, charities and all that, and I think some of them would rely upon crime as well. You see, uh, wh some what, of them what I have to say to you, if I may, Professor Friedman, is that so far you have been looking back on history. You, uh, you haven't sought yet to answer the questions that we're going to have to face in the next 5, 10, and 15 well, give years. It, give him a chance to answer that, and then I'm going to bring in I'd like to. No, I will be very glad to. First place, there are some very simple laws of economics that so far as I know have never been controverted. One, one is that if you offer a higher price for something, you'll have more of it. If you offer a higher price for being unemployed, you'll have more unemployed. If we have the experience in America, for example, where there is absolutely no doubt, because we've had some very careful studies of this, that the increases in unemployment benefits account for something like one to two percentage points of our present unemployment level. We have another example in disability benefits. We have in recent years raised benefits for people who are disabled, and we have lowered the standards for qualifying for disability. And we've had a very large increase 
in disabled people. We've had the same experience with people retiring at age 62 or 65 because what we call Social Security benefits have become available. I'm happy about So that. if you offer people higher prices for being unemployed, you'll have more unemployed. In the second place, many of the people who are listed as unemployed are not unemployed. There is an underground economy. They work, but they work in ways which are not reported. We had the woman on the uh, film saying that she was afraid to take a job because Social Security would get her. Not all the people who are unemployed and who are receiving well, benefits ask, are that way. Let me ask Jack Jones, what would be the reaction of the trade unions if uh, people were to seek jobs by offering to work at well below trade union rates? Well, of course we'd oppose it, but if Milton Friedman is saying that wages ought to be raised well above uh, unemployment benefits, that's fine. I've been arguing that for a long time. Too many employers do pay low wages, and in consequence there are people who will remain on the unemployment register because the opportunity for a job isn't such that it will give them a higher income to any great extent. But you know, the people who you talk about who are in the, what you call the black economy or the underground economy uh, are few and far between. If you go to the north of England and the Midlands where unemployment now is very substantial, frankly, men simply cannot, men and women in many cases, simply cannot find a job. What do you do about the man who's, who's say, 55, 60 years of age, who's been working for a firm for 30 years and loses his job? He hasn't got the opportunity. There are, there are not the jobs to go to anyway for him to, 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 are, get, to get work. There so many, that, is, that is the situation. There now, are many difficult cases. The other, but, you see, what you must realize, let me just finish. What you sure. must realize is that a lot of our unemployment in Britain, and it may be partly the case in the States, but I don't think quite the same, a lot of our unemployment in Britain is technologically, uh, uh, technologically based. Let's face it, mechanized mining throughout two or 300,000 miners. Uh, rationalization of the steel industry is, is going to throw out a lot of people. Uh, in, uh, in many of our industries, for example, in the docks, half the working population lost their jobs over a period of time by voluntary redundancy. I mean, trade unions didn't allow them to be kicked out, but they, they, they left and there was no recruitment. The result was uh, over half the, the dock population uh, uh, is now working as against what, what it was in 67. Now that's rather typical and therefore we've got a basic unemployment problem that can only be assisted by, by government uh, support in terms of training, uh, developing other industries, putting in investment the private industry hasn't put in to, to certain industries. Uh, so as to give... I mean, it, it so. private industry has not put in investment. It fact, if it is not, it has not <coughs> been allowed to make a return so that the money didn't find its way and there's been no investment strike. All right, I exercise, I exercise my, my chairman's role for a moment, if I may, Jack Jones. Because we, we wouldn't have Ferrantes. <laughs> we wouldn't have Alfred Herbert's machine tools. We wouldn't have even Leyland, and you might say, well, we ought not to have you it. But the fact, okay, you may say that, <laughs> but the nation needs a motor car industry. We the, the nation does not need Milton, a motor car industry. The, the, na the British nation. nation supported Fords to provide jobs. It supported Chrysler to provide jobs. Of course, and it the shouldn't have done so. The alternative no, was sure. further I saw, I saw the for a moment. Respond briefly, but we must not speak yes. exclusively about unemployment benefit because social services no, include no, many no, other important no, benefits. No, and no. I want to press David Ennels in a minute about the negative income tax. So respond but briefly would, if you would. Fine. I just want to go to the trade union problem. In the first place, employers are not the ones who decide what wages they pay. The great bulk of all income is paid out in wages. The amount of discretionary income and profit left to employers is very small, as I am sure you will agree, sir, Sir Hector. But in the second place, the effect of trade unions, the effect of trade unions is to create unemployment. Trade unions, by forcing up wages and keeping limiting opportunities, uh, benefit their own members, but at the expense of forcing other people into activities for which they are less well suited and driving down the wages the elsewhere. Of the United right. States, but in Britain we, in are, Britain, we are used to productivity bargaining. We're used to piecework, and incidentally, in many of our industries. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, my friends. In many of our industries, the initiative, the initiative for taking away piecework what came from the employers and not from the trade unions. And I was one of those who preferred gang and group piecework than the plain time rate system, which did tend to reduce effort. 
did tend to mean that employers was, were, were paying out more than they needed to have done, but it kept wages lower than they ought to have done. Dick Jones, that's the last, that word, on, last word on employment. I don't want to get back to the social services, <laughs> and I want to impress David Ennels uh, on this. We may have lost sight of something which could be important in what Professor Friedman was saying. He said that he was not just in favour of abolishing all the cash payments we make. He was, said it in part that he was in favour of having a different system, a system under which the money would flow automatically to people just in virtue of the level of their income. So if your income was low, you would receive what would be a supplement, whatever it mm. was called. Part of the thrust of that, as I understand, is to get the bureaucrats out of the business, to remove what he called the godlike powers, which you no doubt felt uh, when you were Secretary of State for Social Services, the discretion which enables um, one man to make decisions about another man's life. Now, quite apart from the pure cash aspects of this and poverty aspects, which would be equally taken care of by either system, isn't there some merit in that notion? There is some merit in it, but you can't just take the cash element out of it, because uh, Professor Friedman must know uh, he will have examined <coughs> it, as we have examined negative income tax in Britain. Uh, it's much more costly. Uh, than is our present system. Are you sure that the bureaucrats in your vast, huge department, as it was, don't to some extent enjoy the process of the power and the discretion no, they, they have over the lives of other people? You see, uh, when it comes to discretion, they don't have very much discretion. Let's look at it carefully. The vast proportion of the money that is paid uh, goes in terms of uh, retirement pensions, then of course the child benefit. There's no discretion in either of these two. There's a little bit of medical discretion when it comes to uh, various disability allowances according to the degree of disability of the person concerned. And there is too much discretion in terms of supplementary benefit. Uh, and uh, we have had a review and we shall have to see what happens. The, uh, uh, we're debating in Parliament now the, uh, the results of that uh, review. Uh, and uh, I think we will have to see some reduction in the degree of discretion that is allowed to people. But the vast proportion of what is spent on welfare uh, is, is not done discretionally. It isn't civil servants reaching conclusions. Well, let, it is what people have a right to because of the government that they've elected. Sir Hector. People actually don't have a right to anything. They don't have a right to a job or a standard of living. It has to be earned in the face of very stiff international competition. And the, the real problem that is, uh, that is being argued about just now is the amount uh, of government spending, because that, in fact, crowds out private investment. There's not investments, right? The government needs to raise money, the interest rates go up to get it, and that does not allow us to invest, and that, therefore, we don't have productivity, and that's the root of our problem. I agree very much with Sir Hector Lang that the real problem has been that government in this area has been that government has been absorbing so large a fraction of the income of the people that it does not leave enough for any incentive for people to use it or for the possibility of using it on the question of the negative income tax and its cost it all depends on the numbers and the levels if you set a neg if you say we are going to have a negative income tax in which nobody is going to get any less than he now does every single person is going to be held harmless Everybody's going to get at least what he now gets. There is no possibility of doing it except at very high cost. But that isn't the only option. Mr. Friedman, Mr. Jack Jones, Mr. Hector Lang. Mr. Ells, thank you very much indeed. And that's it uh, for this week. We hope you'll join us again next Saturday at roughly speaking the same time in which we shall be seeing Professor Friedman's film Created Equal, which discusses the not merely economic but highly political, almost philosophical question as to whether or not uh, the state and uh, the legislature, the parliament, has the right to concern itself with the degrees of equality or inequality in a society. Until then, from all of us,